drink beer, it's good for you. Hello and welcome to the second part of the How to Homebrew Beer series. In this episode we'll be looking at yeast, fermentation methods and equipment types. So let's get started. If there is just one thing that you take away from this video then I urge you to realise just how vital yeast is to beer. As a great bonus, understanding how important the conditions you put your yeast under during fermentation would also be fantastic, but let's start off now by looking at yeast in its different forms before progressing further. If you look at any homebrew store's website or physical store, you will notice that there are many different types of yeast out there, and these are offered in both liquid and dry forms. A question that I get asked rather a lot is which is best, and I usually answer back that yeast is yeast. But to expand on this answer, the best yeast for your beer is going to be more about the type of effects you are looking for from your yeast, rather than its form and packaging. We will talk more about yeast selection later. Let's now look at the pros and cons of liquid and dry yeast. Firstly, dry yeast is cheaper than liquid yeast. One package of liquid yeast can be double the price of a sachet of dry yeast, and to make this even worse, your average sachet of dry yeast has double the amount of yeast cells compared to liquid yeast. However, a big pro for liquid yeast is its sheer selection. If you are looking for a speciality strain, for example, that is used in commercial beer, then the chance of finding it is much higher within the liquid yeast selection. Dry yeast itself is certainly grown when it comes to selection, and personally I find that I seldom use anything but dry yeast these days, but my needs will not cover everyone else's, of course. Another area where dry yeast scores a major pro is its longer life before expiry, which in some cases can be years compared to liquid yeast three to four months lifetime after production. There are some strains of yeast that are available in both liquid and dry forms. For example, the Chico strain which can be found within Fermentis US05, Y Yeast 1056 and White Lab 001. This is a classic yeast strain and everyone will have their favourite when it comes to these three suppliers versions, but for many the differences will be slight and this is more about how the yeast has developed over time rather than the format that it is sold in. As I said at the beginning, yeast is yeast. Let's now look at yeast selection, and as we have already established, there are many choices when it comes to yeast. Yeast selection these days is easier to narrow down by beer style, as many types of yeast are named in such a way that you will know which are suitable for a given style. Once you have narrowed things down, then there are further choices that can be made by reading about each yeast's characteristics. This information is not all going to be present on the packaging, so you will need to look at the website of the manufacturer or the website of your homebrew store. This example shown on screen shows Lullamon's New England yeast, which gives good information about flavours and effects to expect from this yeast. You can expect tropical and fruity esters, and there is an enzyme that can promote hot flavour and aroma. All very nice for a New England style IPA. This is simply Lullamon's initial information too. Further information can be gained by looking at the data sheet, which is on the same website, but this is certainly a good start. Here is another example from Mangrove Jacks on their website in relation to their Hophead Owl yeast. This is a very similar style of yeast as you can read from the notes here shown on screen. Here we also have enzymes for promotion of hop flavours of aroma. Both of these yeast types mention two characteristics that can also be key to your choice, and these are attenuation and flocculation. So let's explain these now. We can also at the same time compare these two different types of yeast further for selection. Attenuation is the yeast's ability to eat fermentable sugars within your recipe. This is typically classed as medium or high for beer yeast and is sometimes shown as a percentage range. There are no agreed numbers for what a high or medium attenuation rate is, so you will see different companies showing some different numbers here. As you can see on screen, the attenuation rate of the Lullamond yeast is classed as high, whereas the Mangrove Jacks example is classed as medium. This essentially means that you can expect the Lullamond yeast to ferment your beer a little drier compared to the Mangrove Jacks yeast. Let your own taste or the vision you have for your own beer influence you between these two yeast examples. Do keep in mind that this is just an estimation and a Attenuation can vary depending on variables like temperature, for example. The other term mentioned by both companies is flocculation, and here are the details for each of this on screen for comparison. This is quite simply the yeast's ability to clump together after fermentation is complete. This allows the yeast to drop down faster, meaning that it can lead towards a clearer or brighter beer faster. 
Typically you can expect wheat beer strains to have the lowest flocculation because the haze is part of the style. Medium flocculation strains are the most common, so do not worry if your yeast selection includes one. There are various methods of clearing beer that will act as a solution should you be looking for crystal clear beer. Another factor that is vital to consider is the alcohol tolerance of your yeast. In the example shown on screen you can see that this can vary by quite a lot. In general beer yeast will have at least a tolerance of 9% but as you can see this can lead you into much higher levels of alcohol too. So before you brew something stronger always check that your yeast is up to the task. There are other factors involved in yeast selection but these can be affected by your fermentation method so let's look at these now. There are essentially two core methods, the first being simply a regular fermentation and the second being known as fermentation under pressure. So let's now start with regular fermentation. Regular modern day fermentation is performed by equipment that involves at the very least a fermentation bucket and an airlock. Airlocks can have various different designs and a couple of the more popular ones are now shown on screen. The airlock acts to allow carbon dioxide to be released during fermentation so that there is no real pressure build up. Because the vessel is sealed and the airlock is the only open point it is also designed to keep oxygen and bacteria out with a liquid barrier. This liquid can vary from simple water to alcohol. Regular fermentation vessels can be made of food grade plastics or stainless steel, with plastic offering the most economic route for the short term and stainless steel offering the best and economic route for long term. Stainless steel vessels also tend to be more feature rich with features like built in heating and cooling functions as well as easier ways to bottle or transfer into kegs. They also have the benefit that they will be much more hard wearing than plastic in general. If you scratch your plastic vessels, even in a very shallow way, then to be sensible this will mean you will stop using it for fermentation as scratches become very difficult to keep clean and sanitary. Many beginners will start brewing with regular fermentation vessels and the biggest mistake they will make will be not to have temperature control. Due to this the temperature will often vary and the area they ferment in can either be too hot or too cold for their yeast. A temperature that is too cold will simply stop the fermentation and a temperature that is too hot will cause off flavours in the beer. Temperature control will keep both of these problems in check when it comes to regular fermentation methods. Let's now look at the alternative. Pressure fermentation is performed using equipment that is suitable and safe for pressure. Part of this safe setup is a spunding valve which allows undesired pressure to be released which prevents yeast death and explosions. Shown on screen are two different popular types of spunding valves. Both of these are classified as diaphragm spunding valves which is a vital feature for reliability. You can see that both of these have a gauge that shows you the level of pressure and a yellow handle for pressure adjustment. There is also a second type of valve known as a pressure release valve often shortened to PRV which acts as a backup for safety. These should be rated to release before the maximum pressure that the vessel can safely handle is reached and are standard on pressure capable equipment which is not just fermenters or unit tanks but beer kegs too. Both the spunding valve and the PRV are vital for control and to ensure that the whole setup can be used safely. Here is a selection of pressure vessels, once again you can see that food grade plastics and stainless steel are used. These vessels can also be used for regular fermentations and because they can hold pressure they can also offer a functionality known as being a unitank. Unitanks not only allow fermentation of beer but also serving of beer in the same way that you would from a keg. So whilst this equipment is potentially more expensive than regular fermentation vessels, it is dual purpose potentially saving you from having to buy a separate keg for serving. One drawback here is that you cannot ferment in a vessel that is already being used for serving, so if this is your only vessel then your production will be paused. If you are pressure fermenting and your temperature is too low then this will stop your fermentation, but having too much heat will not be a problem at all because the pressure will stop your yeast from producing off flavours, and this is one of the core benefits of pressure fermentation. To finish up let's now draw some pros and cons by comparison of these two methods of fermentation to provide full information and a greater understanding. A pro for regular fermentation is that the basic setup is cheaper, though do keep in mind that with a pressure fermenter that you often have the ability to dispense beer from it and thus this offers a saving on buying a keg. 
One major advantage of pressure fermentation is that it protects against off flavours caused by having too high a fermentation temperature. Lager yeast, for example, is typical demand temperatures as low as 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. To go down to this temperature will require at the very least usually a fridge for fermentation. Failing to do this without pressure will result in off flavours in the end beer. Another pro for regular fermentation is that there is simply less to think about, making it easier, which can be very welcome when you first start brewing, with various new things to learn as it is. Having said this, do not think that pressure fermentation is not simple, because that would be untrue. Another great pro of pressure fermentation that it often speeds up the time that fermentation takes. Lager fermentations in particular can really speed along when performed at higher temperatures, but even yeast that is recommended for use at high temperature will often see a time saving with pressure. Furthermore, pressure fermentation allows you to almost remove the risk of your beer ever becoming stale. This is effortless if you ferment and then serve from the same vessel, but it is also easy to perform when in an enclosed pressure transfer from fermenter to a keg if you wish to. It also has to be said that beer fermented under pressure will usually taste cleaner and more crisp compared to a regularly fermented beer. As a final note, pressure fermentation is perfect for lager and hoppy styles where no yeast flavour or aroma is required. However, if you do require yeast flavour and aroma for, say, for example, Belgian or British styles, then simply have no pressure for the first three to four days of the fermentation, which is when flavour and aroma is formed by your yeast, and then after this point you can add pressure. This can all be controlled very easily by just simply using your spunding valve. I do hope that you found this video useful, informative and interesting. If so, why not consider liking and subscribing? For further support you can join the channel's Facebook group and if you would like to support the channel then check out the channel's merchandise store as all profits go back into the channel. Until next time, happy brewing!